Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is session 22. This is the, the Sonship Review, part 6. And this is session 22. All right. I was handed a question at the break. So I want to deal with it because we're right in the middle of this. And so uh, it, it is, who does the writing on our heart? Do, do we do that heart writing or is God doing that heart writing? Because my terminology has been, you know, I'm going to write this on my heart. The, the truth of the matter, I mean, to be precise, and I need to be precise about it, is the Spirit of God does the writing on our heart. That's part of His job. He does that in response to the effectual working of God's Word. So let's, let, let me see if I can put this process up here. So you have... heart writing, and that comes from uh, the effectual working of the Word, and you, we can't do that either. We've talked about that. I, I, you know, I can talk about the Word, but I can't make it effectually work in you. So, where does that come from? That is a product of... All right, now I almost want to skip this first part and come over here and talk about here is a form of doctrine. Let's use the one that we're in. Here's Paul talking about the things that are happening to him. Even under this present hour, we hunger, thirst, we're naked, buffeted, have no certain dwelling place, we labor, working with our own hands. And then he talks about the things that are happening to him and how he responds to that. Being reviled, we bless. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We're made as the filth of this world, the offscaring of all things unto this day. So here, Paul is giving you something here that tells you how he is responding to these things. There's more to it than just that, because we just picked out a, a few verses right here. But here's a form of doctrine that educates you about how you should be thinking and how you should be responding when these things now are beginning to happen to you. And then out of that form, how does that, and there's a process. I was talking to Mark at the break about this, so I'm going to say it to everybody. It is possible for a person to come to church, that come here, and when we were back in justification and explaining that justification is by grace, through faith, without works, and we know that, it is possible that a guy could sit in here and listen to that and when he first came in, he had all these ideas, like, because of the way churches have done this, I have to come down the aisle, or I have to pray to receive Christ, or I have to... But you understand, all those are works, aren't they? So really, saving faith is nothing more than trusting what he did, and him alone, not him and my baptism, or him and my church membership, or him and my good works, or him and my, you know, singing in the choir. Uh, it's not any of that. You know that, but here's my point. It is possible for a guy to come in and not understand those things, and sit through justification, and at some point, if you were to say to him, are you saved, he would say, Yes, and if you said, how do you know you're saved? He would say, because I am trusting what Jesus did for me in His death, burial, and resurrection to satisfy God's justice. And, 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 and if you said, and when did you get saved? It is possible for him to say, you know what, I don't, I don't know when I came to that. And do you know why? Because it would have been a process that didn't happen in a moment with him. It was a process of understanding different pieces of the doctrine until one day, that is what he believes. I'm trusting Jesus as my all-sufficient Savior. Him and Him alone. Nothing else. 
and I know that that is God's remedy for my sinful condition. Now, if, is he saved? He is. Is he going to heaven? He is. Even if he doesn't know when he did it, isn't he still justified unto eternal life? He is. But you know, we have always, and I'm, I'm talking about the, my background, was always very big on, you know what, you need to come down and let us pray with you and all that. But people have the idea that I, I, because I prayed and asked him, that's not it. It's not about that. Those are really technically false aspects of the gospel. You know, and we have terminology that we've used, and we, we just kind of use it because we know what we mean by it, but it's, it's not precise. You know, I, I asked Jesus into my heart. Well, we've used that kind of terminology, but the truth is it's not about asking... Yeah, it's not about you asking Him to come somewhere. It's about you trusting what He's already done. I mean, that's really the truth of the matter. Now, why am I bringing that up? I'm not trying to re redo all of that that we covered back there in justification. But in answering this question, I'm saying it this. Here's a form of doctrine that we're faced with. And then we, through sonship prayer... Through a process by which we are talking to our Heavenly Father about this doctrine. Let's do it right here. Lord, I don't real, I'm not really looking forward to being persecuted because I'm living as a son. I'm not really looking forward to being reviled or persecuted or defamed. Those are not something I got up every day hoping, boy, I really hope I get some persecution today. But through a process of talking to your father about this doctrine, honestly, and believing the doctrine, you will come to a point where that word will do its effectual work in you, and your desire to escape those bad things will diminish, and your desire to be conformed to the image of His Son will be elevated. until, And it would be possible as you become a... as you work your way toward becoming a fully educated son, it would be entirely possible for someone new to come into this church and see something happening to you and see the way that you're responding to it and say... I mean, let me just use Bud for example. They might look at Bud and say... How, how in the world can you do that? How can you... Because look, remember what Paul was talking about? When those things were happening to him, he got to a place where he says, I rejoice in infirmities. But he's not... God's not just saying that. And Look at this process up here. When can you truly rejoice in infirmities? Just because God said to? Where along this process would it would have to you wouldn't be able to do that until this whole process had been done and only then can you rejoice in the things that previously you didn't want. Do you see can you see that? That So it's not you need to act a certain way in order to make this happen. This is all part of a process that has to take place with us. And that's what I'm trying to get across to us here. So what happens in the midst of that? Then the Word does its effectual work. The Spirit does what He is supposed to do. And that's the heart writing. And when that thing gets written in our heart, then all of those, not consequences, but all of those results are then going to be able to be true for us. We're going to rejoice in those things that previously we wanted to avoid at all cost. So, when I'm using this terminology, and I just need to get better at being precise about it, when, I, when I'm talking about the heart writing, you do understand the Spirit doesn't do that no matter what you're doing. I mean, that's not an automatic thing. That is in response to this Word doing its effectual work. And that effectual working of the Word is in response to the process 
that we're going through with our Heavenly Father. And before you can go through that process, you have to be, you have to hear, or you have to become acquainted with the form of doctrine, and then you have to understand that form of doctrine. Because, and then once you understand it, now you're going to go through that process with your Heavenly Father. And don't expect that you're going to, you know, I'm going to pray for, for 10 minutes and in the 11th minute, all of a sudden everything's going to be magic for me and it's all going to be that way. This is, this is something that just has to be, it's going to take time and effort. And, uh, and that's the way it's supposed to work. And so, does everybody get that process? Does that make sense? Okay. Yes? I've been doing some study and it says you are the son of the five people that you hang around with. So if we're as a body and some of us doesn't don't get it, doesn't get it now, my friend. Someone doesn't understand it, then as the son, as the five of us, we all need to come to the same what is it, mindset? Right. Look, you know, the old, yeah, well, you know. Back in early, you kept saying separate. You need to learn how to separate and make decisions, you know, not to hurt the family or others. Right. Well, look, you know what? There is a real, um, um, uh, what's the, the word that I'm looking for? You know what? We are influenced. Yeah, it becomes double in blocks. So. It does. It does. Okay, so thanks for that. Now, okay, so having said this, the Spirit does the writing on our heart. He does that in connection with the Word doing its work in us. That Word does its work in us as we have gone through this process, which started with us hearing this Word and understanding what it's saying. So, so in, in some of these things that we're doing, you're going to be further along in the process, but in some of these areas, you may be just now really understanding some component of the doctrine. So now I've kind of laid out the road map of, of, of where we need to go with that. Now let's take this thing here, and I, it said, being defamed, we entreat. The word I-N-T-E-R-E-A-T. -E well, I'm going to give you the Oxford English Dictionary because the word entreat, which is E-N, not I-N, uh, you have to understand that in, to, in, in today's English language, the I-N has become E-N. Those were not two different words. It's just when they uh, codified all the spelling of everything, that became E-N. There is no I-N anymore, but this is exactly what it means. So, to entreat means to persuade by pleading, to beseech, or implore. And when Paul said, you know, when, when I've been defamed, this is what I do. I try to persuade them by pleading, beseeching, or imploring. When you read how Paul, let me back this up. When you read how Paul is doing this, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. If you're not careful, you can kind of get the idea that Paul's just going to roll over and let people just walk all over him. And that he's not offering any kind of resistance to that. But what Paul is doing is very purposeful. And, and I want to talk to you about that for a moment. So let's take this one right here. And labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Let's talk about bless. What does that mean? Well, when I looked up the word bless, there were a lot of meanings for the word bless. I didn't, I, I had to get all the way down to the eighth definition to have something that was relevant to what we were talking about. Because to bless, let me just give you an example. I didn't give it to you in your notes. To bless means to consecrate something as holy. Well, that's not what Paul is doing here, being reviled, we bless. He's not consecrating anything to make it holy. It also means to consecrate someone to an office. That's not what he's talking about. I think the fourth definition was to make the sign of the cross. You know, to bless yourself. Well, that's not what Paul is doing. So, I, 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 the reason I trim those first seven out is because they were totally 
using the word bless in a very different way than Paul is using it here. So when we get to, to this one, here's what we have. To bless. To account or call oneself supremely happy. To make oneself happy with that or in that. And when Paul says, so, now I'm going to back you up to that verse again. Being reviled, we bless. Now you would think that what Paul might do, now by the way, we also know that he entreats. And you know what that is? To persuade someone, to implore them, to plead with them, to make a case for something. So it's not like he's just saying, I don't care what you think. He is, he's trying to make his case. But you understand what he's not doing is attacking them. He's making his case. And when he says, and when I'm reviled, then what I'm doing is I'm, I'm just counting myself to be supremely happy. Now wait a minute. Is Paul mentally off because someone is doing that? But once again, I would bring your attention to this. When someone is reviling Paul because of godliness then here's what Paul knows. I'm evidently making an impact on the ones my father meant for me to impact. I'm impacting Satan in his realm. And so, as he's talking about this, this uh, and, and we're going to get to another uh, definition here in just a moment, here's the next one. He says, oh, I did that one, I'm sorry. All right, verse 12, And labor worth our, working with our own hands, being reviled we bless, being persecuted... We suffer it. And he knows that God's not going to take that away. Now there is a way for Paul to make the sufferings of Christ stop. <sighs> wow. My eyes came out about that far right there. Um, do, you, do you know... I've got to reco recover from that. Do you, uh, do you know how Paul can make the sufferings of Christ stop? I mean, he says, we suffer it. Someone could come along and say, hey, Paul, you know there is a way to stop all that. What is the way? Stop your sonship life. All that will go away. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Not an option for Paul. And so he says, so being persecuted, we suffer it. Uh, look at this next one in verse 13. Being defamed, we entreat. Now, we'll read the rest of the verse later, but I want to show you this definition for being defamed because this one is pretty nasty. Nobody would like this, but here it is. Defame means brought to disgrace, dishonor, attacked in reputation, slandered. And I'm going to tell you that when that happens to someone, their immediate response is to kind of back away from whatever it is that they're being defamed about. So, when... Um, I'm trying to think of a situation here. Look, there will be times in casting off the works of darkness where you will be accused of being, and you can fill in the blank with a whole number of things. Let me use the one that was really in vogue some years ago. You're intolerant. Look, when it's about godliness, I've already decided what my response to that will be. I am. But see, when people go, you're intolerant. You know, the natural response is to go, oh, no, 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 I'm not intolerant. Well, God is. There are things He's intolerant of. And remember, and we talked about this in Romans 13, where if you're going to be thinking like your father, you're going to need to love the things that he loves. And what's the other side of that coin? To hate the things that he hates. God doesn't hate some things because he's a bad person. He hates some things because of what they are by their very nature. They are opposed to everything that is good and righteous and holy. And God hates those things. And so will we. But you know what? You'll be called a hate monger. You'll be called intolerant. You'll be, you'll be called a bigot. You'll be called all manner of things. And here's what you've got to get over. 
And I'm, just because I'm saying it this way is not how you get over that. You're only going to get over it by using the doctrine in this process we've already put up here on the board. But what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to quit responding to that. When people accuse me of something, and, I re and that's really true for me, then I just go, you're right. Because some of those things, folks, I'm not pretending I'm perfect, but I'm saying for some of those things, they are really meant to be a badge of honor. Elitist. You know, I mean, hey, yeah, you, you get all, 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 all kinds of things are going to get said. So we just need to come to grips with that. So uh, when we get straightened in our own bowels, when we think that we're going to step back from some form of doctrine because we realize what that may mean, how people will think about us, or how they'll treat us, or whatever. And we decide we would rather be known as being wise in Christ instead of fools for Christ's sake. When we would rather be considered to be strong by the world that is looking at us rather than be perceived as being weak. When, when the world is looking at us and they would rather, we would rather them see us as honorable instead of being despised. Those are the things that Satan is counting on to cause us to back away from casting off the works of darkness and putting on the armor of light. And so the cure for that is sitting right here. I, I, well, the cure is sitting in the doctrine. But what the doctrine is meant to produce at the end is to overwrite some things on the table of your heart's likes and dislikes so that they line up with your heavenly fathers. And so this whole passage that, and we haven't read this whole passage, but let me just put it on the board. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 17 the reason I'm giving you that is because that is a big piece of the doctrine for having your father's table of likes and dislikes written on your heart. And when that happens, then when that heart writing takes place, this is what Paul calls having your heart, what? Enlarged. Remember Paul talked about the, having his heart enlarged? And then he says to, to them, be ye also enlarged. And then when we went back into the Old Testament and talked about the believing remnant when they said, we'll, we'll, we'll do this and we'll do this and do this when, when God enlarges our heart. That's going to be true in both programs. So he calls this the enlarging of our heart. So the cure to being straightened or narrowed or constricted is to be enlarged. That's exactly what's going on with that. And so what does Paul say? Now I gave you that piece there. So in verse 16 of that, here's how Paul's going to wind that little piece of doctrine up here. He says, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. I know you see all the things that are happening to me, and I know you don't like them. But you really need to be followers of me. And he's not just talking about just mimicking me, you know, or, 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 or acting like, you know, let me just try to copy what Paul is doing. That, you know, this little thing that years ago came out, WWJD. What would Jesus do? Now look, I understand the motive behind that. People are saying when you're faced with a situation, you need to figure out what Jesus would do. But you understand that what Jesus did was out of what he learned from the doctrine. And that doctrine transformed his inner man. It built him and matured him. That word worked in him. His father's heart is written on his heart. And as a result, he is an obedient son. Obedient even unto death. And he is able to do that. So when you say, what would Jesus do? Even if you think you figured out what Jesus would do, let's suppose you're in a situation, you say, well, if it was Jesus, he would be more patient. Well, if all you know is WWJD, all you're going to do is try in the best effort of your flesh to be more patient. And that's not what your father is after. He is after godly, see out here, let's put this, 
I just rejoice. But patience. But godly patience comes out of this process. Please don't be discouraged by that. Don't look at that and go, everything's going to be work. Well, it is. But you do understand that once the work gets done, you have it to draw on from then on. Doesn't mean you'll always do it, but it'll always be available for you. Okay, so... Let's see where I kind of lost my place here. Um, I was going to give you one more scripture. It's not in your notes. That's what I was going to do right here. Um, because when I... Well, let me just read it to you right here. Take a look. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That was the problem at the church in Corinth. They had brought in a bunch of you know, big shots in the world's eyes, and they come into the assembly, and, uh, and it says, For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? That word fellowship, look, I don't want to teach this passage, but knowing everything that's in this passage is going to be really important. Later, Paul is going to talk about, in Ephesians, he's going to talk about that to make men see what is the fellowship using that word, of the mystery. That's something that we haven't talked about very much, but we need to be able to know what that term is talking about. Now, because it's the mystery, we know it has something to do with this present dispensation of grace. But what is the fellowship of the mystery? And what, what, what are men supposed to see? And I think I was talking to Sandy after the service last week about this issue, as a matter of fact, because, because Paul doesn't say, and to make men understand what is the fellowship of the mystery. He says, and to make men see. In other words, this is a visible display of something that this group right here is supposed to be putting on display so that people will look at that and obviously understand something. Something marvelous that is now called the fellowship of the mystery. All right, well, let me just leave that alone right there. But he says, for what fellowship hath righteousness, okay, I'll just say this, I'm sorry, I can't leave it alone. Because when you get to the word fellowship, I'll tell you a real easy way to think about what that means. Fellowship. Think of a bunch of fellows in a ship. They're all together. Now, I do want to do more. Now that I've said that, I feel like I need to say more, but I'll stop. And together. And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. I'll be a father unto you, and ye shall be my... This is important. And ye shall be my sons and daughters saith the Lord Almighty. Now Paul is taking something that was said to Israel right back there, and now he's going to talk to us about being his sons and daughters in connection with that. The deal went 